Initiating podcast download. Prepare yourself. Put on your spandex. Lace up your boots. Wrap your wrists. Hide your razor blade. Head to gorilla position. Grease up your hair. Apply baby oil. Okay, apply more baby oil. Get into gimmick. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. Have fun and be safe out there, brother. Welcome to I'm on Wrestling. Now your host, Gregory Iron. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Iron on Wrestling with Gregory Iron. This is episode 114. Could barely get through the intro before this bullshit. Pardon the meow interruption, but Kitty want to play. Stop it, man. Now you're just abusing that because I told you that that was the topic of discussion this past weekend on the Zoom chat, which we do exclusively for Patreon for $5 members. And your stupid meow can't want to play is over. Fucking piece of shit. I mean, um... You're talking about stuff from the past. You had a Zoom call or whatever this weekend. Yeah. Okay, I'm talking about right here, right now. Ugh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you okay then? <laughs> All right, phoniest cough ever. Kitty got a hairball. Oh, right. Thanks Somebody for wasn't in. manscaped. Thanks for tuning in again this week. <laughs> and now tuning out. Yep. Uh, last week, so we dropped a bonus Patreon episode on Wednesday, which was a little abnormal for us because we're a little bit behind because we wanted to wait for the approval of our guests to make sure it was okay to drop the episode. So we, of course, dropped episode 113 on Friday. And I thought maybe that episode would suffer a little bit because it was on an awkward day that people aren't used to, but it's one of our fastest downloaded episodes There's a buzz. Ever. Yes. Jake Christ appearing on the podcast, telling his story, not only about his, his rise into professional wrestling, his uh, diet, his body transformation over the past year, but also his release from Impact and his relationship with Brother Dave, who, you know... Vanished from pro wrestling after speaking out, and uh, I'm I'm just glad that Jake's side of the story is out there. And if you haven't listened to that episode, I encourage you to go back last week and check out episode 113. This week, however, for episode 114, we have a guest returning to the show, and I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm trying not to get emotional here because I thought, uh, well, first of all, I never thought we'd have him back on the show. Um, but I was very worried that I would never, ever <clears throat> uh, whew, see him again. And uh, thank the good Lord, if he exists, Eddie only is back. And he's on the show It's uh, today. nothing short of a miracle. It really is. I, I We hadn't seen him in nearly nine months, but he made his dramatic return at H2O, Two weekends ago, it aired on IWTV this past Saturday. So if you want to go check out the return of Eddie Only in the casket match between G-Raver 
and Ricky Shane Page on H2O. You can watch it for free if you use promo code IRON. That's I-R-O-N. You get a free subscription to IWTV, a free trial. So you should ch- definitely check out the return of Eddie Only. But today, free of charge, if you're listening on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts, you get to hear this interview with Eddie Only. Where's he been? Where's he going? That's what we're going to find out today. Are you excited? Uh, this might be my most anticipated episode. Wow. I mean, because uh, I was worried sick. Were you? About Eddie Only. Well, he's alive and as well as he possibly can be. We, you know, and when we went and got these tattoos, mm-hmm. I didn't even know it was him. <clears throat> yeah. He yeah. didn't have hair. He, we may or may not have had seen him for a second. But he, he's the one that did the tattoo. Yes. Okay. Yep, he, right. he, he gave you your arm tattoo. Yeah, but I didn't know. I didn't even know it was Eddie. Yeah. I was calling him Edward the whole time. I was so confused. That's the same name, basically. Wow. We actually posted a video of Eddie only giving Aaron and Patreon subscriber Ryan Egan their Conrad Thompson podcast tattoos exclusively on patreon.com slash iron and wrestling starting at three bucks you get all that bonus content so check it out when you have time check out all the other tiers because you get extra videos zoom calls which you're involved in which we talked about earlier you get bonus podcast subject choices you get stuff in the mail from aaron and i which will be sending out a package by the end of the month exclusively for people that are subscribed to twenty dollars and up it's i mean we should probably just tell the people right now what this month is probably going to be a Small package. I don't know what that means because I feel like it's going to be one of our better packages. So if you sign up for the $20 tier, you will get your money's worth. That's what it's all about. We want to provide your money's worth. And this episode hopefully provides you with a buttload of content and fun. Because How, today, how expensive is this episode for people to download? Uh, free on iTunes or wherever you download podcasts. Well, then they're going to get what they pay for. Okay. <laughs> That's the episode. All hey, right. give you a kiss goodbye. No, no, we're not what? done. We're not done. Oh. But since Eddie's on the show today, uh, which giving you a little preview here, we, I try my hardest to get information out of him as to what exactly he was up to for the period of time in which he was missing. Tattooing. I, well, we'll find out. But I will say that we delve into maybe a little bit of a court issue. Mm-hmm. We delve into li- a little bit of a crack issue <laughs> we delve into maybe some tattooing and perhaps maybe some food truck situations and uh, it's it's going to be an interesting listening listen to say the least the was last, this guy tattooing motherfuckers out the uh, food truck well i you'll have to listen to the episode to i'm gonna out. and you know i always listen to these episodes yes you do the last time we talked to Eddie Only on the show was back in January, so a lot has changed since Jan- um, not January of 2021, January of 2020. So it's been a while, and we're happy to have him back on the show and alive. But you know, in thinking about this situation with Eddie missing for so long, I was trying to think back in my brain. There's got to be some situations within the course of wrestling history where other wrestlers have gone missing for a prolonged period of time. Does anything? jump into the mind for you Aaron when you think of missing wrestlers nope okay and that's the episode now we're gonna go to the interview with Eddie only and after a word from our sponsors wouldn't that be the best if we just did that yep today's podcast is 12 minutes long Mm -hmm. (laughs) no um I don't know immediately what comes to mind because you asked me about it when we were off the air was uh Cactus Jack lost in Cleveland. Yes. What a what a weird storyline. That's that's during a very strange period in WCW. This is like just when Eric Bischoff comes into power, I believe, 93, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, definitely a transitional period because you just go through the Jim Hurd era and then we're coming out of the Bill Watts era and those are very two very different eras. I mean, Jim Hurd was trying to be heavy on gimmicks to be like the WWF and then Bill Watts wanted to take wrestling back 20 years and not have guys jump off the top rope and t- took which, the mats off Which the one of them wanted it to be uh, called international object instead of foreign object? See, I don't think that was an, an, an 
Was edict, that a TBS from, thing? I think it was from Turner. Okay. That they yeah. they don't want to offend anybody, so instead of saying uh, foreign object, you had to say yeah, international but, but, object. <laughs> it was ridiculous because it wasn't like it was from a different country or something mm-hmm. like that. Like those brass knucks right. were made right here in the U.S. of A. Right. You know, Alabama, USA. Very weird. Very yeah. We we're just, <laughs> we we're just talking about a situation with porn bots spamming people and how they. You know, if they're a porn bot, how they would actually talk as opposed to, you know, a real person. But that's a whole nother story. For <laughs> yeah, another that's, that's Patreon. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But uh, yeah, so Lost in Cleveland thing. Yeah. I don't remember the storyline. I believe he, that well. Uh, Cactus Jack had been um, suffering from concussions. This is like the, the, you know, I don't know that you do the storyline anymore because concussions are so prevalent. Sure. And back then people were just like, oh, yeah, he's got memory loss from being power bombed onto the cement by Vader. <sighs> yeah, that um, he had amnesia. That was a very right. popular thing uh, back in that time period. I, I I don't know if you do amnesia storylines anymore unless you, uh, I don't know, you're out of touch. Mm-hmm. You know, I, like people, I don't amnesia. I mean, it, it must be a real thing. But have you ever even met someone that's had amnesia? I mean, it's a it's actually. You know, I have. Yeah. I didn't talk about this. Uh, I tried to talk about it months ago, but I didn't bring it up. This is a little sidebar here for a second. I knew a guy for a second, but I couldn't talk about it because I was sort of uh, working in close proximity with him. Mm-hmm. He claimed to have amnesia at one point in his life. And this point was a, you know, it's a good timing to call amnesia. Because he had just murdered a woman, and S- someone uh, you know, you said. Well, he didn't know. I didn't know the woman, but I know knew this guy, and I found out through the grapevine. I just thought he was a normal. What's grapevine? Is that a like an app, a dating app, or something? <clears throat> no, someone had told me. Oh, oh, like I heard it through the grapevine. Yes. Okay. Wow. I just, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you. Talk to me about things that usually, you know, you're on some dating website. Okay. I, I have a girlfriend. Oh, that's so. right. How, how's that going? It's going great. Yeah? We're, I, Are you, what have you guys been doing lately? Hanging out. Yeah? Going out to eat. Oh. Doing stuff. Uh-huh. Oh, stuff. Yeah. Um, I've done stuff before. Okay. Anyways, this guy, <laughs> this guy that I worked with for a second in my life, just thought he was like a normal 50 year old man he used to tell stories about working in the prison yeah and then someone googled him and came to me and said yo this dude never worked in prison he was actually in prison and in the news article oh. in the wait new- i think i know who you're talking about yeah now. you remember this okay now? yeah yeah in the news article he basically befriended this woman and the husband and he was like he would like do odd jobs for them mm-hmm. this was back in the 80s and they had like two or three kids, and then the dad took the kids to Disney World. Oh, I thought the dad needed relief. <clears throat> no, that's a documentary from oh. Netflix. Very different situation. Uh, and I was dumb enough to. Uh, <laughs> what a weird documentary. So uh, they end up going to Disney World. The wife stays at home f- because she was working on a school project, and as part of her school project, she was interviewing people about like their biggest fears and things of that nature. And so she ends up asking this guy, the, I guess the, the dude doing ob jobs around the house, what his biggest fear is. And he went into some rambling about how he didn't love his wife and how he was in love with this woman. And she wrote all this information down, but obviously she wasn't interested in him. So basically, a couple of days later, he decides he's going to go back and he says he needs to get this note. This, this note from her because he basically confesses his love for her and all this weird stuff. So he ends up going to the house. A struggle ensues. A gun gets pulled out and he shoots this woman in the back of the head and in, in the back. And so he then called 911. This is all from the article that I read. He called 911 and said that he found this woman shot dead. And they showed up, and they sh- sh- they saw where the gunshot wounds were. I'm like, okay, well, she couldn't have shot herself in the back of the head. Um, so, what's and up? And she was probably fleeing, right? Trying to run away. Yeah, and so all of a sudden, 
they ask him what happened. And he goes, uh, I don't remember. I have amnesia. Mm. And in the 80s, I guess you could say amnesia. Uh-huh. So basically what ends up happening is dude gets arrested. He spends like 20 or 30 years in prison. Then he gets released and he's working at this place. And it's real awkward when everybody finds out about it. Because now we all look at this dude in a very different light. And, but we're obviously not bringing it up because we don't want to be next. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we don't want this guy to get amnesia and shoot someone (laughs) again. So, but Cactus Jack, he ends up having amnesia. And this is after, wasn't it after his program with Vader? Or did it go? I think, uh, I believe what happened was uh, the storyline was Vader power bombed Cactus onto the cement. If, if I'm not mistaken. But, like, why was Cleveland the choice? Like, what was the reasoning behind that? I always thought, like, they chose places based off business. So, like, if you wanted to boost your business in Cleveland, then you mentioned Cleveland several times. Yeah, I guess. I The thing that I remember about the vignettes were, were that they hired a a woman to play his wife because they claimed that his actual wife was too attractive for him. Yeah. (laughs) So they hired a homely (laughs) actress to play his wife, which uh, that would be incredibly offensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Oh, my wife's too hot to be in the (laughs) story because I'm such an ugly human being. Well, he was missing an ear. True. He was missing his front teeth. Yeah. Uh, During the storyline, I think Cactus also befriended some homeless people. It was... um, very awkward storyline, but th- that was the reasoning for Cactus missing because he was lost in Cleveland, but he ends up coming back, and I think they dropped the storyline pretty quickly after that. Yeah, yeah, it was it was weak because it was a lot of build up for nothing. They had another storyline around a uh, similar time where the Desperados were looking for Stan Hansen, who was supposed to be their leader that they were bringing to WCW. I don't remember this. To, to it was Black Bart. Dutch Mantel and One-Eyed Willie or somebody. Okay. That sounds ridiculous. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When was this? What year? I want to say it's 92, 93. Okay. And <clears throat> I really like Dutch Mantel. I like Dutch, too. Did I you? loved him on commentary. Did you Did you get to work with him that one time you came to AIW at all or talk with him? He, I think he did a thing where he managed yeah. to take justice. Yeah, I, I I don't know, a small conversation, just, you know, hey, I loved <laughs> when you were in WCW. Okay. But no, he was always great on commentary. I think he was, like, super underrated. He's actually one of my favorite I think things I remember, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. I think I remember him from maybe GWF. Oh, yeah. Global Wrestling. Yeah, we were just talking about that last week. Yeah. On, on the bonus part of the podcast on Patreon, where we talked about our favorite X-Pac memories. Well... Uh, yeah, I don't know if, if people want to take some time and go out of their way and check out some Desperados and WCW. That was, uh, I liked it. One of the missing storylines that I remember from wrestling. Oh, hold on. I think it culminated with Stan Hansen finally showing up and then just beating all their asses or something. That makes sense. Yeah. Just, yeah. For like six weeks, they looked for this guy and it was, it was dumb little, you know, um, vignettes and scenes where they'd go to like some bar in texas and we're looking for stan hansen we're mean and <laughs> they get their asses kicked every day well you know what you just reminded me of something that i didn't even think about i guess we sort of knew where he went i mean the insinuation was that he took his ball and went home during this time period but it did add for some interesting vignettes upon his return stone cold steve austin ends up walking out of the company in june of 2002 yeah Around 2003, all of a sudden, Vince McMahon sends out an order to Eric Bischoff that if he doesn't change things on Raw and he doesn't get Stone Cold Steve Austin re-signed to a contract, that he will be fired. And so then Eric Bischoff goes out on a search for Stone Cold. Do you remember this at all? I sure do. And uh, he ends up going down to a part of Texas looking for Stone Cold. He goes into a, a little shitty bar looking for him. And he ends up getting into it with some locals, and uh, it makes for a pretty hilarious scene. Of course, 
we end up getting the return of Stone Cold Steve Austin eventually at No Way Out 2003. And Stone Cold beats the shit out of Eric Bischoff on pay-per-view. It's a very yeah. short match, but it's, it's, it's exactly what you would expect. It serves its purpose, after yeah. A, a, out of a match like that. Eric Bischoff. What a guy. Should have got his tattoo. His podcast tattoo. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. What about, you know, I'm sure you loved Saturn in ECW. Right. I'm sure you enjoyed his work in WCW. Yes. How did you feel about his work in the WWF, particularly... When his pal Moppy went missing. Yeah, I was not a fan of Saturn in, in the WWF. Not at all? No. Nah. Why? I didn't like Moppy. But <clears throat> I just, he was not believable to me. For some reason, ECW, he definitely was. Yeah, for sure. But Moppy, I mean, I, look, I enjoyed Moppy. You're welcome. What a, what a catchphrase. But also, this, this is another storyline that stems from concussions. Uh-huh. The angle is he gets concussed, much like Cactus Jack in WCW. He ends up befriending and then falling in love with a mop. <laughs> and then, when was he? When was he dating uh, Terry? Well, this is at the same time because okay. he ends up picking Moppy over Terry. Yeah, she could have been Terry Saturn. She could have been. Unfortunately, in real life, she decided to get with New Jack and. Eat his butthole profusely. <laughs> it's a thing she was a fan of. That bitch an asshole eater. Yep. You remember seeing those shoot interview <laughs> clips? It's just that bitch eat ass. Didn't even want him to wipe it. Oh, oh that I don't remember. Mm, no. Oh. Yep. Oh man. Look up New Jack Terry Reynolds shoot interviews. It's uh, it's something. Is it something for Emily? I don't know if Emily does that, but um, but yeah, Moppy was missing, and I think uh. I want to say it was like at Unforgiven 2001. He was at WWF New York, and he had Moppy on the side of milk cartons. And he said, you know, she's beautiful. You could see her from a mile away with her long flowing hair. She's very slender, of course, because she's a mop. And eventually, Moppy ends up showing up in the hands of Raven, who's now with Terry. And they end up live on Raw putting Moppy into a wood chipper but like most live segments they don't get the wood chipper to work right away do you remember watching this Aaron yeah it was a train wreck right yep they had a hard time getting the wood chipper to work and eventually they do end up getting moppy in the wood chipper and that's r.i.p for moppy and pretty much by this point it's r.i.p for Saturn's career he ends up showing up in tna uh about a year or two later but uh, that's uh that's all she wrote for his top runs in wrestling. But, um, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, my God. This man. R.I.P. Aaron. We don't, we don't want to say that, but uh, it could happen. The most relevant missing storyline that I can think of. Again, not really a missing storyline per se. You, I mean, kind of, sort of. You were wondering where he was. There was a search for him. At the 1994 Royal Rumble, The Undertaker ends up being put into a casket and then seemingly floating to the heavens above or into the rafters of the arena that they're in that night. And he's missing for months and months until, of course, Ted DiBiase brings back The Undertaker or, should I say, The Underfaker? Oh, yes. you said it. Because it wasn't the real Undertaker. It was, of course, Brian Lee playing the role of the Undertaker. Paul Bear started claiming that the real Undertaker was going to return at that year's SummerSlam. SummerSlam 1994 in Chicago. And leading up to that, there was a series of vignettes. A search was on for the Undertaker. And who better to lead that search than the man who played in Naked Gun... Liam Neeson. That's not... No, that's the wrong guy. That's the wrong guy. Leslie Nielsen. (laughs) Okay. I like how you did not purposely botch that. You actually got it wrong. Leslie Nielsen was the one looking for The Undertaker. (laughs) And I remember these vignettes a lot as a kid. Very entertaining. It did seem like they got a lot of randos off the street to portray characters that had 
supposedly saw The Undertaker. Remember a guy from the deli in New York claimed that he saw The Undertaker and uh, uh, just a bunch of other people. Do you remember these vignettes at all? Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Like, I hated it. You hated the story. Again, you yeah. you were a little older than me, so right. you just were not interested in this at all? No, no. There was no interest for me. <clears throat> I think you gave me your cough. Mm. It's now transferred over to me. No interest. Yeah, I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit. I hated the match. Well, I, you know, I think a lot of people hated the match. Even as a kid, I don't, I wouldn't say that I hated it, but I didn't know who was who because I was like, what, seven years old? Yeah. So I didn't consciously realize that one had purple gloves and one had gray gloves. Right. And I didn't know who was supposed to be who. So I just, and I think that was this sort of the dilemma with the live crowd. They couldn't really tell the difference, so they didn't know what to do. And Vince keeps putting on commentary. Uh, the crowd is in shocked silence. No, they're just really confused by what's happening. And possibly bored. Yeah, not a good situation at all. Just yeah. uh, I got one for you. What? But this might have been before your time. What's that? Do you remember when Matilda went missing? Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit before my time. I roughly remember the storyline, but uh, run it past me. Lay it out for me. Uh, the Islanders were being managed by Bobby the Brain Heenan, and they stole the British Bulldog's mascot, a bulldog mm -hmm. named Matilda. Yes. And they had the dog in hiding for weeks until... Um, something happened. Oh, you don't remember? What? No, we got interrupted. Oh, no. We're, we're not interrupted. We're fine. <laughs> Give me a second here. Yeah, so then Bobby Heenan... Um, got a case of amnesia there for a second. He couldn't remember <laughs> what you were talking about. Bobby Heenan and the Islanders kidnapped Matilda, and for weeks... Um, no one could find her. She, they, uh, Islanders and Heenan did not return her. They said she was in a safe place that they heard or something like that. And mm. then President Jack Tunney said they'd all be suspended from the WWF forever mm. if the dog was not returned to the Bulldogs. So Matilda was returned. And they talked about she may have been malnourished, which you can't even have that as a storyline now. Definitely not. Right. Well, I feel like they did a lot of things to animals back in the day that you could not do anymore. You can't have a wrestler that's 500 pounds sit on a snake. Well, they didn't actually do that. I that's mean, what I, they did. I mean, but they didn't really do it. You know what, what I'm saying? Mean? Like, they no, did, like there wasn't an actual snake in the bag. What? Okay. But I'm saying like, like yeah. when I th if you want to talk to the snake incident, I think we talked about this in a bonus episode, the way snake, the uh, Jake handled that snake with Macho Man, I mean, there would be some sort of animal reptile companies. We just watched over. that at work this uh, last week. Yeah. And everybody at work was like, wait, how does that happen? Like, how do you just fling a snake around and then it bites a man's arm? Exactly. And then that guy's bleeding. How, mm -hmm. how do you fake that? And I go, I'm trying to tell you guys, wrestling is not fake. It was not a fake occurrence at all. It was very real. And then our friend... You know, the guy I introduced you to, we call him DDS, he um, he told the story of how Macho Man made Jake have the snake bite himself earlier in the day in the locker yeah, room. Yeah, yeah, because he didn't trust anybody. Yeah. Weird stuff. Trust me. Okay. Any other storylines where guys went missing for a prolonged... I feel like there's a lot that I'm just not able to... I'm sure there is, and I'm sure I don't really like it when guys go missing. Well, I guess, you know... Uh, a, Every week on, on uh, AEW, somebody gets kidnapped, but they're back, like, the next week. Really? I haven't been following it. Yeah. It always seems like somebody's just going... Uh, NXT, they did it for a while, too. Who's Johnny's boy? The, the young guy. Austin Theory? Yeah. He ran away from home, bro. I thought he got... Uh, he was missing. Well, he was missing. Yeah. Actually, he got kidnapped by... Kidnapped by the, the psychotic guy. By Dexter, Dexter Loomis. Dexter somebody. Dexter Loomis. Yeah. Kidnapped him. What about, you know, I was thinking about, I guess, I guess this is also counts as missing and ridiculous, much like Undertaker floating to heaven for a little bit. The uh, Edge and Undertaker end up having a Hell in a Cell match, I believe. This is SummerSlam 2008. And 
The Undertaker choke slams Edge from the ladder. <laughs> Straight to hell. Through the ring. Fire then comes out of the hole in the ring with the insinuation being that he had <clears throat> choke slammed him straight to hell. Yeah. And so then Edge ends up coming back later in the year. I believe it's like Survivor Series or Armageddon or Survivor Series. He has a long beard, which I appreciate that touch mm-hmm. because he had just come back from hell. Mm-hmm. And you know, can't shave down in hell. Yeah, but you figure it's so hot, it would singe all your hair. Maybe, I guess, yeah. I didn't okay. think about that. Well, you really killed it for me. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Well, but yeah, those missing story. Mike lines. Tolar? Well, we did that in PWO, actually. Yeah. yeah. So Mike Tolar is missing, which basically. And he was on, it was on, there were flyer sheets for him, right? Well, so so Mike Tolar, to sort of set the stage of who he is, he was under a de- uh, WWE developmental contract for a couple years, and he wrestled at St. Ed's, which is a very big school for wrestling in the Cleveland area, which was also home to one Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler and Mike Tolar happened to be best friends. They were both on a contract at the same time. Obviously, Dolph's career went a little farther than Mike's. Not to say that Mike wasn't talented. Mike ends up getting released from his WWE developmental contract Since he's a local boy, we end up using him in Pro Wrestling Ohio. And his character was really fun, and Mike was a great guy. And he was on the verge of actually becoming the PWO champion. And we were going to do some stuff, I think, between him and Gargano. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) he didn't really tell anybody. For whatever reason, he just stopped showing up to shows. Yeah. And so we needed to sort of write him out of TV. And his character was fun because he was an amateur wrestler, but he had sort of transformed into like, I, I, I don't know how to describe him. He was started doing a thing where he was wearing women's T-shirts on top of his biker shorts. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like I, I don't know why he started doing that, but he was a little bit more flamboyant. And I think it worked for him. And then he had his little uh, minions which was were these guys EJ Giorgio yes. and yes. Ben Fruth yes. that he forced to do all of his bidding, but also he forced them to wear women's t shirts as well. And it just it was it was weird, the but it was women's t shirt thing, I have no recollection you of. You don't remember that at all? No, I remember the hell out of some E. J. Giorgio. Well see but <laughs> Uh, and Ben Fruth. I, I, I don't want to make any accusations and I love Mike. Uh, so just in case he hears this, but I think the insinuation was that maybe Mike wasn't feeling in in the best physical condition of his career. And so he started women wearing the women's t-shirts to sort of conceal that maybe he, his, his physique wasn't what he wanted it to be, which I feel like it might've been some body dysmorphia type issue. I don't know. I mean, I always thought he looked in great shape, but Mm -hmm. I think that's why I started wearing the women's shirts. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, he ends up vanishing from PWO, and so Ben Fruth, who uh, he was sort of the underdog character on the show, I feel like he always had the, a better wrestling mind than a wrestling body. He would always come up with ideas that we would end up using on TV, and he was the one that said, well, if, we, if Mike Tolar's gone, why don't, to keep the story going, I just start making these Mike Tolar's missing posters and flyers, and he made milk cartons, but the best one was the missing poster with the age progression photo Yeah, since he had gone missing. So it was clearly the same photo side by side. You know, he was missing last month, and now yeah. this is what he might look like this month, and it's the same exact photo. <laughs> so it's just, it was good stuff. I forgot we did our own missing storyline. Yeah, yeah. I remember one time, just side note, I was, I was driving, and um, I got a phone call. And it was it was our good friend who had been missing. And he said, hey, can you help me out, buddy? I said, what's going on? He said, I was coming back from the show, and, well, I ran out of gas. Wait, this is Mike Tolar? Yes. Oh, 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 okay, all right. I see what you did there. Wow. So I like Mike Tolar a lot. Um, he's always very nice. You know? Great guy. Great yeah. Guy. Yeah. I hope he's doing well. Real good dude. And um, we had, that wasn't our only missing storyline in PWO. 
Uh, Jimmy DeMarco. Did we do a story out of that? All of a sudden, he was gone. He was missing. Well, I get maybe well, nobody could find him maybe. after he tried to <laughs> anally penetrate your ten-year-old yeah, brother. I was gonna say maybe the police picked him up or something. <laughs> I, well, I feel like he went missing because he didn't want to do that storyline, and he was embarrassed that we are now portraying him on the show as a uh, you know a pedophile. So yeah. he just stopped working for the company. I think that's how that played out. Uh, then he returned wearing a mask for one show, maybe. Nope. Never. I could have swore this guy wore a mask. Never I came back. I don't think he did. I okay, think, or so, maybe that was a proposed. So I angle. it was proposed. So I think what happened was he was supposed to do a run in in a mask on a show after we had done the angle. Which if you've never listened to the back catalog of the podcast, I'm sure we've talked about this at some point. We basically did a horrible, horrible, very regrettable, very bad, poorly executed to catch a predator parody on Pro Wrestling Ohio where Jimmy DeMarco broke into my house while he thought that I wasn't there because he wanted to beat up my 10-year-old brother. I think he was 10 at the time, Zach. He wanted to beat him up. But we insinuated with having Joe Dombrowski in the house like Chris Hansen that it was, you know, he... It was, it was, this was classic stuff. It was not... It uh, was it's not, not on... TV anywhere anymore. I think it's not on YouTube. Not that I I've if, seen. If it's not on YouTube, I'll have it, to find well, it. But it needs to be. I think it is, but it, it's really fucking bad. But anyways, so I think he was embarrassed after we did this. But what was supposed to happen was he was supposed to show up to, to the next PWO show in a mask, attack me, reveal himself, and what was supposed to go down was my little brother again, who was ten years old, was going to get in the ring, and then Jimmy as my brother like is over top of me, like Zach gets up, gets in Jimmy's face and, and Jimmy pushes him down and like beats up a 10 year old kid. Going to be real controversial. <laughs> and then it was going to culminate in a match at resolution two, where it was me versus Jimmy DeMarco, not for the custody of my brother. That was not the idea <laughs> behind the storyline. We weren't going to go that far, but, uh, so Jimmy claimed, I think that he had been arrested and had amnesia. I, I don't think he said the amnesia part, but that seems to be a trend. And he didn't come to the show, and then he never came to a show after that. Okay. So that's how that played out. But I, I will say that years later, and I don't know if Zach mentioned this on the podcast. I know he's told me in real life. Zach, Zach Thomas, my brother who wrestles, ran into Jimmy DeMarco a couple months ago at an <laughs> IWC show. And Jimmy walked up to him and... As if he didn't miss a beat. He goes, Snackery, good to see you. Because he's, <laughs> he's the one that started that nickname for yeah. him. It's because you know, uh, he said on commentary one time, just like, oh, his little brother Zachary, more like Snackery. And I'm yeah. like, okay, that's... <laughs> so for, for not wanting to do that story, Jimmy sure the hell played into it very well. Jimmy always gave 100%. Jimmy was great. Very talented <clears throat> individual. But uh, hey, are there any other missing storylines in pro wrestling that we didn't mention today? Well, if there are... You should send them our way via tweet, via Instagram, via Facebook. You can find us at Iron on Wrestling, and you should be following us on social media if you aren't already. We're posting, we're posting. That's not a word. We're posting unique content all the time. There, videos, pictures, rare photos, especially. We posted some Jake Chris stuff this past week, or invite rare pictures from a couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm sure we're going to be posting some stuff of Eddie only this week, and then a few cat pictures. Uh, I don't, there's no reason why we would post cat pictures. Oh, check out my Instagram. No. Hmm. No, I'm not going to do that. Nor is anyone else. So yeah, if you could unfollow Aaron, if you're following right now, please do so. What about on Facebook? Could I post them there? Don't post anything. Don't make any cat noises either. What about birds? I don't even know where this is going. Uh, did you see I posted a bird flew into a window at work? Oh. Yeah. I had to give CPR. To a bird? Yeah. Okay. She lived. Did you also uh, eat some food, chew it up, and then spit it into the bird's mouth like a mama bird? No, because I'm a man. Well, I don't see any papa birds doing that. Right, and I'm a man. Okay. You... <clears throat> but I, 
That's where I should post it on Twitter. This is tweet, tweet going downhill tweet. very fast. I promise you this episode will get better. If you are listening to the free version of the podcast, I hope you're enjoying it. We're going to go to the interview with Eddie only very shortly. But before we do that. Wait, you found him? We already talked about this dipshit. Oh. You know he's going to be on the show in a little bit. Sorry, a small case of amnesia. Oh, we're going to keep going back to that joke. Listen. I hope you Wait, don't f- you want more cat jokes? No. Okay. I would hope that you don't forget that being in the pro wrestling and or entertainment business that it's very important to have quality merchandise. Ah. I mean, not only does it help you when it comes to bringing additional revenue in for yourself, but the look and the feel of the merch is a representation of the brand that you're building. So you probably don't want it to suck, right? Right. Well, you got any ideas where you can get some decent merch? I mean, I know a guy. Do you? Yeah. Who knows a guy? Is it the same guy that I know? Who is a guy? Who's a good buddy of mine? Yeah? What's his name? Juan of the Ortiz. Okay. No, it's Juan Ortiz. Yes. And he runs Of the Dead Designs. Of the Dead Designs is a one-man merch Me company amigo. ran by artist Juan Ortiz. Mi bueno amigo. Stop showing off. Mi gusta la pizza. <laughs> That's all I know because I cheated off a kid from Argentina in Spanish class. Oh, boy, a lot of cheating going on these days. His name may not be familiar to you, but his artwork should be. You've likely seen his designs on TV and in Hot Topic, and he's created some of the highest-selling tea designs in pro wrestling tees history. That's right. Of the Dead Designs has created artwork for the biggest names in WWE, AEW, ROH, Impact, New Japan, and beyond. I mean, we're talking the biggest names. We're talking the Hulkster. We're talking the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. How about the Young Bucks? Kenny Omega, Road Warrior Animal, the Lucha Brothers, a guy that may or may not be returning to pro wrestling from Chicago, CM Punk. Yeah. He's got... Oh, Phil? Uh, yeah, Phil, my good friend, my my good my good buddy. Yeah, oh, Phil. You can't say his name in like a phonetic Spanish way. It's just Phil, like Juan. Is that how you say Juan? Juan. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to say Juan. No, no, that's no good. It's not working. No good, chili pie. You're probably saying, "Whoa, I'm not in the league of the Young Bucks, Harold Kogan. How am I going to afford of the Dead Designs?" Well, get that thought out of your head because of the Dead Designs is affordable. And Juan isn't just looking to create art for the superstars of today, but the superstars of tomorrow as well. And look, Of the Dead Designs doesn't just do artwork for wrestlers. If you need some sort of artwork done for, I don't know, an upcoming wedding, uh, perhaps uh, you just want to make a drawing for your friend. I'm trying to think of an occasion in which you would need some artwork done. What's coming up? It's uh, summertime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Summer Fest is coming up. Summer Fest is not a thing that Summer exists. Slime. I don't know why you'd want artwork of SummerSlam, but if that's something you're Summer into. SummerSlam. I don't know what that is. Vince McMahon, 1995 SummerSlam. Welcome, everyone, to SummerSlam. I feel like. Did he say that? I don't know. Yeah, that's a real thing. Okay, so would you get artwork of SummerSlam? <laughs> yeah. What's In that? like a Nickelodeon font? Okay. You could do that if that's something you're into. Uh, is there any other. Uh, oh, Guardians? The new Cleveland Guardians? Okay. You because obviously the, the the logos that they made up <laughs> came up with people hate. Not the best. So maybe you could. Maybe Juan. <laughs> me. Juan. Bueno. That's how you say it. Juan. <laughs> it sounds like you're doing Stone Cold's what? Juan. What? Okay. Juan. Maybe, maybe someone out there could pay Juan to make a better design for the Cleveland Guardians. Whatever the case is. Juan has 14 years of experience and a portfolio of notable clients that speaks for itself. Of the Dead Designs will make your artwork at a super reasonable price. And get this. If you mention this ad, you'll save 10 buckaroos on your first design. What could you do with $10, Aaron? I could have a three-way with two alpacas. <laughs> you do. That's disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Both of them sniffing each side of my mustache. Well, you're only paying them each handlebar of on, my mustache. You're only paying them five dollars to sniff your mustache. It's, I don't think sex comes with that. Also, I didn't say sex. 
<laughs> the three-way sniffing mustache. Okay. I didn't know if you were going down like some weird Kurt Angle circa 2006 bestiality path. Dude, you're going to have to refresh my memory, but let's do that on a bonus episode. Oh, well, uh, maybe we can. You don't remember Kurt Angle bestiality sex? No. <laughs> what? You know what? We're going to do that on Patreon here in a second. <laughs> I don't think I want to. But uh, I like animals. But uh, Liz, I got to let you know that you can contact Of The Dead Designs right now on Instagram mm. at Of The Dead Designs, or I'm sorry, at Of The Dead 209 on Facebook at facebook.com slash Of The Dead Designs or go to his website, Of The Dead Weebly.com. Juan Ortiz and Of The Dead Designs bringing your artwork to life. Now, if you're listening to the regular version of the podcast, you'll still be hearing the regular version, but you're begin- you're going to be missing out on bonus content we're about to talk about right now, which includes apparently impromptu bestiality sex involving Kurt Angle, but also I wanted to do a little bit of a discussion on perhaps Daniel Bryan and CM Punk heading to AEW. Aaron, what do you say? Are they? Well, we're going to talk about it. What do you think? We're going to talk about it on Patreon right here, right now. Here we go. Only if you're on patreon.com slash Wrestling. Well, on Patreon, we just rambled for about 41 minutes, and we thought we were going to talk a lot about Brian and Punk, which we did, but we also talked about, of course, uh, a little bit of a sidebar with Aaron about uh, Kurt Angle and the bestiality sex for a little bit, and a bunch of other topics that came up. Stop doing no, that. No, no, it's over. But, you know, uh, the Olympics are currently mm-hmm. occurring, Aaron. Yes. Have you been following? Uh, bits and pieces here and there. It's weird because, again, there's no crowd there. Yeah. You know, and then when you're watching everything has a crowd back and then this doesn't, eh, it takes away a little. But I've always liked watching the Olympics. Obviously. What do you, what, what's your favorite Olympic event? What's something that you go to? Or do you not watch at all? I don't really watch. Okay. Awkward silence. Well, I, I, I thought you liked sports and stuff. Okay. I don't watch fake stuff. Ah, uh, you're a son of a gun. But if I were watching the Olympics, you know, I'd probably be rooting for Team USA in all categories. Eh, it doesn't matter to me. I like good competition. Uh, table tennis, I think, has been my favorite. What are you, Forrest Gump? And... Um, I do like beach volleyball. Okay. Great story. But, you know, there's several. <laughs> there's well, fuck you. You <laughs> asked me about Olympics. I'm telling you what the fuck I like, well, you I'm... cocksucker motherfucking fuckface fucker. I'm just saying that even though I'd be t- cheering for Team USA, you know, several different teams are competing in the Olympics. I'm sure we got representation from the UK, Europe, Australia, probably even South Africa and Singapore. Singapore? Is that how you say it? How do you say it? I don't know. You already disturbed me. How did I disturb you? Well, you asked me about the Olympics. I started into something, and then you went, yeah, cool story, bro. Go ahead, finish your little diatribe here, or whatever you want to talk about. I wanted to talk about Manscaped. Oh, okay. Let's talk about it. (laughs) Why are you so unhappy about Manscaped? I love Manscaped. Do you? Yeah. You yeah. don't sound like it. No. Here's what it sounds like. I don't love you. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Well. I wouldn't even shave my balls for you. I don't want you to shave my balls for no, me. No. No. Me. Sh- I wouldn't shave my balls. Why would you say I would shave yours? I don't want you. Is that something you've been thinking about? I don't want you to shave You've your been balls thinking about it. Me. I knew it. Oh, that's so cute. It doesn't matter what country or continent you represent. I don't think you can say those words. What are you talking about? This is the worst ad we've ever done. (laughs) You're the worst ad. I'm trying to cleverly segue into Manscaped. Talk about it. You dumb fuck. (laughs) It doesn't matter what country or continent. I said it again, even though I apparently can't say it. You represent. I think everybody in the world would be on board with Manscaped. And I say that knowing that Manscaped just launched all over the world. You can be anywhere in the world. Dude, I saw it in Target the other day. 
Well, of course, because that's part of the world. Yeah, I know. I'm saying, like, that's how big it is. Like, I went to Target, and I was like, whoa, what's this Manscaped display? But if you go to Target, you do not get 20% off. You do not get free shipping. That's very true. The only way you get 20% off and free shipping is to use promo code PARDON. P-A-R-D-O-N. But what do you get? If you use our promo code, well, you go to manscaped.com and you get the lawnmower 4.0, which of course is great for shaving those pubes. You get the 4000K LED light that's on there that helps you shave those pubes just a little bit better. If you don't have the best illumination in your house, that light is going to help you with that. Of course, it also features the skin safe technology, which helps you prevent from any unsightly nicks or cuts on the testes. You don't want that. And, uh, of course, it's waterproof. Can't forget that. So you can use right. it in the shower. You can drop it in the sink, and you'll be perfectly okay. We don't recommend that. Or you can just clean water. it. You can clean it. It'll be perfectly fine. I mean, you're using it on your balls. You, I mean, if you're someone like Aaron, you might want to use it on your face, too, which I don't know. Uh, that's not really for me. I mean, the point of the lawnmower 4.0 is to not use the same thing that you use on your face as your balls, but, you know, to each their own. But it doesn't matter because with the lawnmower 4.0, you could shave your testicles Wherever you are in the universe, you can even shave your anus. See what I did there? Oh. Because the universe, your anus, pretty clever. Cool story, bro. Oh, wow, you're mocking me. Now, the Performance Package 4.0 will get you the lawnmower 4.0, but it also gets you the Weed Whacker. Hmm. It's like having a little astronaut to chop your worst weeds up top for your nose, your ear, whatever. The hey, weed whacker I want, is I want also you to waterproof. Look. What? I want you to look right now. Look at what? Into my ears. I'm not doing that. Just see. Is there a lot of hair? No, but there's a lot of Why? wax. What? Huh? There's a lot of wax. You have a lot of wax. Wax on, wax off. Put some Q-tips in that bad boy. Jesus. Oh my gosh. What? <laughs> <laughs> weed whacker has 9,000 RPM motor. 360 degree rotary dual blade system also has skin safe technology and don't forget that the performance package 4.0 also comes with the crop preserver the ball deodorant and the crop reviver to help your little planets be on their a game while feeling the sun's heat mm. Mm. And that sun gets hot baby like iron on wrestling we got that hot deal for you 20 percent off and of course free shipping by using promo code pardon that's p-a-r-d-o-n do your balls a favor. Try Manscaped. Help the podcast by trying Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com. Use the promo code PARDON. We'll thank you, but also your balls will thank you. They've been thanking me every day. Have they? How do they sound? Uh, uh, do an impression of your balls. Meow. Uh, what? No, nope. it does not okay, sound okay. like uh, a cat. Hey. We thank you for giving us... <laughs> <laughs> Keep, keeping us neat and tidy. <laughs> Where are your balls? Why were they cla- were they clapping against your thigh? Oh yeah, they clapped. <laughs> they're, they're low hangers. Well, huh? yeah, I told you that before. Once you uh, get older, <laughs> once yeah. you get to be my age, they hang real low, Boy. and they dunk in the toilet when you're trying to sit down. Well, we've learned a lot pee about in the morning today. That's disgusting. Sometimes when you're old, you have to sit and pee in the morning. Okay. Well, your your back and stuff. Okay, gotcha. go ahead. All right. Well, that's uh. Something. <laughs> now we're gonna go to for Emily. No, well, I don't no, know I don't think she wants any anything to do with that. <laughs> we are now going to go to one more word from our sponsor. When we come back, we're gonna go to the interview for the first time in eight months. The people will hear him speak. We got Eddie only on the show. When we come back, that was the interview with Eddie only. We're happy that he's home, safe and sound. I thank you. Eddie, for your time. We will return to the Iron on Wrestling podcast in just a moment, but I wanted to take a couple minutes of this time to let you guys know that if you didn't realize it already, Iron on Wrestling is a DIY project. That's right. I'm recording all this myself. I'm editing it in-house all by myself. I'm coming up with the segments and the content, and I'm making sure that each and every Wednesday, 
by investing countless hours of my personal time, you guys have a new, unique, and entertaining episode blasting into your ear holes. So I hope you don't mind that for a few minutes each episode, you have to deal with a little bit of advertising. Because quite frankly, I gotta pay those bills somehow. But you know, I don't just pick anyone to be an advertiser on the podcast. When I choose an advertiser for the show, I want to make sure that it's someone that can bring you, the listener, value. I often talk about Of The Dead Designs and my good buddy Juan Ortiz who can create you a unique logo or t-shirt design for your personal brand. But once that t-shirt design is made, who's going to print it for you? Well, that's where Jesse Massey and SBS Printing comes in. Jesse is a good friend of mine, and much like me in this podcast, he's DIY. For over 10 years, Jesse has been printing t-shirts and hoodies in the comfort of his own home, and he's been the official t-shirt printer for guys like myself, Atticus Coger, Eddie Only, Ricky Shane Page, basically all the 440 guys. My favorite thing about Jesse Massey is the quick turnaround time. When I go to Jesse and I need a shirt design printed right away, I know that he'll have it ready for me within three to five days, sometimes even quicker. And on top of that, he's affordable. Jesse and SBS can print one color shirt designs for as low as five dollars. Five bucks. Where are you going to find another deal like that? Now you're probably thinking at a price like that, there's no way these could be quality, long-lasting prints. Eh, wrong. They're super high quality and they're going to last you a lifetime. Jesse and SBS can print you t-shirts, zip-up hoodies, sweaters, and so much more. I encourage you to hit up Jesse right now. Shoot him an email at antiseptic at gmail.com. That's A N T I S E P T I C Max Rock at gmail.com. With Jesse Massey and SBS, you're going to get the best. That's no BS. This past Saturday, it finally aired on IWTV the weekend before that. Eddie, we found you. And my heart was filled with so much joy because you don't know how worried I was about you. You don't know how worried the group was about you. I got to ask you, where the hell have you been? Listen, man, we just got here. We're not going to talk about Come it. Come on, dude. There's like, no reason. I'm you here. were gone for like, what, eight months? I, I was like seven and a half. Okay. So oh that yeah. Bad. Who's keeping track, right? You yeah. just you just magically fucking disappeared, as if like this isn't a big deal. Well, I came back in a box. It was like a gift, you know. Sometimes <laughs> you don't need to know. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's Cornette that says if anybody that pops out of a box is going to be over, and you were definitely over when you came out of that box. So I guess like to go back to H two O in that moment. It, it, I mean, at some point, I'm going to get out of you where the fuck you were because it's just <laughs> it's ridiculous to be gone for that long. Talk to me about your feelings in that moment coming back, or I guess maybe even the lead up to it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it was cool. Uh, sometimes when you're gone for a little while, you always have the fear that, well, if anybody will remember. Yeah. Um, which, I mean, that was inside me. You know, like I knew I was gone for a little bit of time. and uh, A little bit of time. It was a little bit of time. It wasn't even that long. Stop no. talking about it. Nearly um, a year. <laughs> it's not even that important. Um, but, you know, when you're gone for, you know, a little bit of time, you're nervous that people might not remember. So it was like, there's a lot of emotions going through. It's like, the, am I going to pop up? And it's going to be like, oh, fuck this guy. I'm just going to go right back in the coffin, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. Or is it going to be like a cool thing? I didn't, I didn't know. Mm. You know, so the reaction that I got was pretty cool. Uh, I, I felt like my favorite part, honestly, wasn't even like popping out of the coffin, but like when we were all in the ring afterwards, it's like hugging and stuff like that. Yeah. It was cool. You know, it brought me back to like wrestling last summer. Right. Because you remember how much fun that was. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was just like a genuine moment being in the ring together with you. I feel like we were happy, and even though we're the bad guys, the crowd was happy. Like, listen, I, I got to know how you felt in that moment before you popped out of the box. Like, were you nervous or whatever the situation was? Because, like, in the back, when I heard the reaction, 
I mean, I could have been more stoked because it almost sounded like a layered reaction because there was this, like, you pop out and people are like, what the fuck? But there's, like, a buzz. And then, like, some people are realizing, oh, that must be someone. Is that Eddie only? And then they come, they come to terms with the fact that it is Eddie only. Yeah. And then they go crazy. And then when you're in the ring celebrating with us, you, you get the Eddie chant. I feel like in being gone, while we don't appreciate that at all, you, you got over huge in missing. So how did you feel in that moment before you pop out of the casket? What's going through your mind? Uh, well, first off, um, I was trying to light a cigarette, and uh, I felt like I was trying to light my first cigarette as like a 12-year-old kid all over again. Yeah. I was like flicking the lighter. Well, you're, I was, you're underneath a sheet, so you don't want to set the sheet on fire. I know. Either. It's like anything that can happen. If it's with me, it's going to happen. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I'm going to catch myself on fire. I'm sure. I'm going to like put the cigarette in my mouth backwards or uh. something. I'm going to cough <laughs> no, and like yeah. throw up like mm-hmm. it's my first one, you know? Yep. Um. But uh, yeah, man. I don't know. It's just like it's even like a like a not like an emotional thing, but like a bit of an emotional thing. Even thinking about it, you know, it's cool because you know sometimes you wonder. It's like with everything you do within wrestling, do people appreciate it? Do people think it's cool? Yeah. Or do people actually like or just don't give a shit? You know, like they just kind of be like, "Hey, man, good man, blah, blah, blah. right?" And then they just walk away from you, like, "Fuck that guy," you know. So I felt like that was like my first time I actually had the feeling of like we're doing something, you know? Sure. This is, this is awesome. I feel like what added to the reaction in that appearance was the where is Eddie only cartoons that led up to it. Yeah. How did you feel when you saw those for the first time? I was surprised because I didn't know. That was like a surprise to me. Uh-huh. Um, I didn't even know about the first one until it was posted. I think. I, mean, I, it, I might have seen it, but I don't really remember. So like, I remember my first reaction was seeing the, tw- like, the tweet about it. Mm-hmm. And I just thought how cool that was. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and it's different too because you're not seeing uh, most – guys in independent wrestling coming out with cartoons no you yeah know? it's like who does that you yeah know? stands out right and off the bat blind blowing. the guy who did it does an awesome job well i do you remember his name off the top of your head i, I don't uh, i don't but if you guys go on twitter uh he was tagged in all the cartoons give that guy some love because he did a great job yeah no it, was it reminded stuff. me of like it almost kind of reminded me of not like crank anchors or anything like that but like older cartoons you'd watch at like two in the morning when you were like 13 oh yeah like there there was like you know? somewhat of a south park vibe to it you yeah. know what i mean just like the style of it just kind of like these shittily drawn characters like <laughs> like shittily but not shittily you know what i mean like it was it was really cool and cartoony i thought it was a little fucked up though that he gave me long hair i mean come on man we all know that i'm have a full head of hair i just decided to cut it short and that's the reason i don't have long hair all anymore. right well let's let's talk about that because <laughs> before you went missing you just showed up one day on the internet with short hair what prompted the haircut i got cut in glass dude that's that's it nothing crazy you know not male pat- not male pattern balding oh it's all from glass yeah it's from glass okay you know, like, you know what it's like if you're in the ring it's sharp it cuts your hair it, well listen i've i haven't done the level of death matches that the rest of 440 does but i mean i was just being a little pussy uh this past weekend after the nick gage matt cardona incident where i got a pretty substantial piece of glass in my leg and it didn't hurt or anything but i've got like a gaping hole in my right leg now and it's like i don't know how you guys are doing that every single weekend sometimes multiple times i mean as we record this they're finishing up king of the death match and i don't know how far eric ryan's gotten but i'm sure he's done at least two three four death matches this weekend and i don't i I don't know how the fuck he does it he is very much as he likes to say a pain pig yeah he feels absolutely nothing i it, it blows my mind it's unbelievable you know and it's it's whenever he does bitch about hurting it has nothing to do with wrestling right you notice that <laughs> yeah. it's always like oh i threw my back out lifting a box or something uh, you know <laughs> yep yep it's always something stupid i mean that's how you get hurt in any situation whether it's in life or wrestling it's never something like crazy that you do it's always the stupidest no. shit ever yeah because if it was something crazy that you did it just you know it'd make you not want to do it anymore yeah. you know but lifting boxes nobody wants to fucking do that so, so. But the, the haircut, though, when when you did it, it wasn't a haircut. It, come on, man. The glass naturally cut my hair like that, and then I would I sweat a lot, so then I combed it back. Why are you, Why are you lying to me? I'm not you lying won't to tell me the story of the haircut. You won't tell me where the fuck you've been. I need something out of you, Eddie. First off, I don't appreciate you cussing at me. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's fine. I'm trying not to cuss as much anymore either. I don't believe that either. Why? Why would you be? Uh, why it just doesn't seem like a character trait of Eddie only? Because maybe I found like God or something while I was gone, and <laughs> maybe I'm just gonna like turn my whole life around. 
so you're doing something involving the church while you were gone. Don't worry about it. Come on, dude. If you were to pick a religion, which religion would you pick? All right, we're going to talk about religion really fast. Um, <laughs> so something that did happen <laughs> okay. in the past few months was, uh, I'm not going to name the bar because like, nobody needs to know that, but I was getting fed a lot of drinks by a 55-year-old woman, and uh, she asked me if I would walk her to her bike outside. <laughs> Okay. So I did because I'm a I'm a kind man. So wait, so she was so she didn't have a car. She had a bike. Right? Yeah, we're not going to talk about why she had a bike, right? but I love she did this already. And uh, so I walked her to her bike, and she sat down beside me, and she put a single headphone in my ear, and we were both listening to Neil Young together because you obviously knew that I have a soft spot. Okay. Um, as I continuously keep blacking out, I'm waking up with less and less clothes on in this parking lot. <laughs> um, once the deed was done, she walked away to a car that pulled up, just a big black car, and I immediately, for some reason in my head, thought I owed somebody money. So I hid. <laughs> I hid underneath the car okay. that was just in the parking lot, just in a puddle, kind of like semi-crying, <laughs> okay. but it was wet outside, so I can get away with it. Yeah. And uh, I waited underneath the car for a good hour, even as she was gone, because I thought they were just like waiting for me, because it's like, yo, we're going to give this little guy that owes us like 100 bucks now for touching this old lady. Oh, no. Ended that- up walking back home with a pair of sunglasses on at like 3 in the morning, knocking on my door to my roommate, opening up to me, crying oh. about how I think I was molested by a older woman oh and man. i think i owe some money money that's okay so so this happened while you were missing well don't worry about it i, th- I mean yeah it did you just alluded to a roommate so you you and you were at home at some point i mean a roommate a cellmate i mean call it what you wanted you know okay. just okay wow we're we're maybe we're, i don't want to call it that because i wanted to be a little more corrective maybe that he's a little sensitive with the subject so i want to call him a roommate what did this have to do with religion again Nothing. Sometimes older people take advantage of younger people in religion. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess that is sort of related to religion. It's, it's very Christian of her, you know? Yeah, it's it's an unfortunate relation to... I'm just uh, a little boy. I just I, I didn't want oh, it. Oh, boy. Know? That's really awful. All right. So I guess since we're not getting... we're I feel like we're making a little progress of where you were. So I guess to sort of backtrack before you go missing, the last time we talked on the podcast... It was sometime in January 2020. Yeah. And as we know, in January 2020, the world was much different than it is currently. A lot of things changed in 2020. Did. We go into the pandemic, and obviously you have a lot of side hustles. You know, the tattooing. I know you were starting to open up a food truck around that time period. Uh, that had to affect you in a big way. Uh, it did. Um, so the food truck wasn't even the original idea. Um, it was supposed to be just like a small like coffee shop where we just sold like cereal, beverages, and sandwiches yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember you talking about that, and I was like, oh, that's a sweet idea because, uh, you know, for those of you that don't know Lakewood, uh, Lakewood is a very hipster-type area, and, and somehow they don't have a cereal bar-type deal, yeah, and a uh, that's dorks, a pretty dude. unique thing. Yeah, a lot of dorks in Lakewood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know who Pikachu is, but he was going to make me a lot of money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh... No, so, like, you know, we were supposed to open. Um, we were about a month away. We actually had a building in line. Uh, we had, like, just – there was a high school. The Lakewood High School was directly across the street. I was already speaking with the school about, like, you know, we were going to have, like, a thing of, like, you bring your, like, school idea and you'd get 10% off. We were going to donate food, like, once a year to the school and do, like, maybe, like, for one of their pep assemblies or something like that. You know, give a bunch of ice cream away or something like that because what what kid in high school doesn't like ice cream? Sure. You know? Um but then it was like March 14th, I think, is when the world shut down or whatever. And we were supposed to sign April 1st. Oh, shit. So we were like ready. You know, we even gave our deposit and everything. We never got that back because the guy was kind of a, was kind of a bit of a scumbag. But uh, it is what it is. You know, 600 bucks. I don't care. Um, so then we ended up buying a truck, um, which we ran a few times during the pandemic. Which did really well every single time. It was very lucky, you know, to have what we had. But then at the same time, though, we didn't run too much just because we didn't really know the state of the world, you know? Right. It was a weird time. You know, it was a very strange time. I spent a lot of time at home. I invested in a bunch of livestock because I am also a worrier about the world. And I've been kind of calling this for, since I was like 10. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so like you ended up getting, uh, you have a lot of chickens in the yeah. backyard. I have 11 chickens. So that, So the pandemic is what spawned that. Yeah, because I've always thought, I mean, I've always, I buy one piece of camping 
equipment a week. That's like I'm, I'm ready if anything's gonna happen. <laughs> okay. I don't know if anybody knows this. I'm a big gun guy. You know, I'm obviously like just trying to learn how to live off of just like me like having my own food. You know, like cleaning my own water. If things are gonna go down, protecting myself and people I also want to protect. You know, like I, I'm very big on that kind of stuff. So just uh, yeah, I end up getting chickens, which we have six grown chickens now that we got during the pandemic. We actually just got five more. Wow. So we have five baby chickens upstairs at the moment. That's the mother crazy. Just hatched three of them. Jeez. And then we bought two more because one of them, the mother didn't want a mother and try to kill. So oh, God. the one baby chicken needed a friend, and that's why it's on our back porch right now. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. You know, but chickens in the city, that's really not allowed, right? Uh, no, we're not allowed to do it at all. Okay, yeah. Um, so I grow a bunch of fruit at my house, and I just give all my neighbors eggs because I get about 25 <laughs> eggs a day. Okay. So I just kind of con everybody, and they'll just like, let me do it, you know? I got you. It's, that sounds very Eddie-only of you, yeah. <laughs> just to convince them. But uh, taking care of the chickens, is it like a is it a hassle? Or no, it's just... great. It's super easy. Um. I mean, realistically, the, the biggest hassle is at 5.30 in the morning just because their chickens are spoiled. They just they just make loud noises until I let them outside of, like, their cage. You gotcha. Because <laughs> they want to roam the yard and just, yeah. like, do chicken things. So, you know, you, you're you doing all this prep just in case the world goes completely batshit. Now, you said you've always been this way. So, like, obviously you were younger around the time period. The only time besides the pandemic where I could think, like, people were – thinking i have to stock up on food and supplies and blah 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 is 2012 uh, was it 2012 what happened in 2012 i was gonna go back to y2k oh okay yeah Sorry. but what, what happened in 2012 that i'm glazing over uh i i can't really remember too much i just remember the world was supposed to end it was supposed to be like i think of the resurrection or whatever oh yeah i yeah. believe the world actually did end. now we're just living in a simulation but then we don't have to talk about okay. that you know? <laughs> All right, yeah whole simulation eight but months you know y2k though y2K. was that something you were worried about uh I mean, yeah, you're, I think, you're kind of a kid. kid. I was like nine. Yeah. Or maybe 10. Sure. Uh, for everybody at home, I'm only 29 years old. I know that's probably kind of surprising to you. It, but, it's very shocking. Uh, yeah, I didn't really know too much about Y2K as a kid. As I got older, I just thought it was interesting because it already happened. Mm. Uh, but outside of that, though, was, I had no more reason to be nervous about it because it already passed by and everything like that. Yeah. You know. So uh, the pandemic not only changed the situation with what ends up becoming the food truck, but tattooing. Is not a thing that's happening. Oh, it wasn't and a thing that's, that's happening. That's at all. the majority of your income. Yeah. So, been... so, what what were you doing to survive, like outside of tattooing, or were you doing tattooing on the side? Oh, listen, I don't know if you know this, but I'm kind of a cowboy. Okay. <laughs> I was for sure tattooing on the side a little bit. Yeah. I had to bring some money in. You know? How does that work? Uh, so, you know, just I I have some I've had same some of the same clients for ten years, which I trust, and then good friends, which obviously I know that I can trust as well people that i just know like wouldn't like lie to me saying they were like if they were sick they would come here you know i'd be like hey if you feel fine you want to get tattooed i feel fine you know like we'll just keep it under wraps and i'll just tattoo you you know i'm pretty sure that's a pretty unpopular opinion to some people but hey listen i don't have parents and i need to support myself so (laughs) i'm a grown-ass man you know i had to make some money yeah um and i've never really been much of like a a, a rule listener too when it comes to like big brother type stuff either so whatever everybody at gcw calls themselves an outlaw i'm an actual outlaw yeah you know <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do in tough situations you know? i do feel like there is a lot of fake outlaws out there but if there was a real one it'd be you yeah um, I, I think i can confidently say yes how many so can't right. be an outlaw in your mom's house you don't have to give me exact numbers but I'm sure since you know the pandemic affected the amount of money you're bringing in tattoo, when you're doing side hustle tattooing, how much money are you bringing in in comparison to what you would be bringing in full time? Like an eighth. Mm, it was not a lot. That's you know? not good at all. Yeah, I think most people didn't want to get tattooed for the fact that like when I would reach out to some of my customers and there was like, thank you for the offer, but we just at this time being like everybody else, don't feel okay just like coming to somebody's house. You know, that I'm not, like, family or whatever with. Yeah. Which I understood. I'm not going to be like, well, screw you, you know? Sure. What are my buy bills? They have bills, too. I mean, you know, so it is what it is, you know? Uh, I would do, like, maybe one or two a week, which you got to think. I mean, I work five, six days a week already, and I, you know, I'm a pretty busy guy. So it's just, like, you know, I'm, I usually do two to three tattoos on a, a short day, you know? So yeah. <laughs> it was pretty rough, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, you at least had wrestling somehow during the pandemic because 440 before the world shuts down really takes off as i mentioned before the last time we talked was january 
February of 2020 is really where I think stuff started to change for the group. And that happens at Run Ricky Run. Where we're in the middle of the ring as part of that riot after being Nick Gage for the belt. Listen, that was a plant. <laughs> there was a bunch of pla- plants that just threw shit in the ring. Uh, I paid somebody off. Yeah, that's uh, that makes a lot of sense there. <laughs> um, talk to me about your feelings in that moment in the ring because, you know, I think me and Ricky talked about it after the fact and because me, Ricky, and Eric, we've been around for a while, I remember saying to Ricky, do you think Eddie and Atticus appreciated that moment? Because it doesn't happen often in pro wrestling. And I feel like you guys, you know, you're still young in the game. Were you in tune with the idea that shit just doesn't get thrown in the ring on a regular basis? And this is real heat that we're dealing with. Did you realize that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was like, I was a bit scared. You know, like not like not scared. I think scared is the wrong word. Um, I just remember as it didn't really hit. Until the announcer said, like, Ricky and, like, Gage's names. That's when it really set in. Because it was like a roar. Yeah. You know? You're surrounded by, well, there's probably, like, 800, 900 people there. Yeah. Maybe 1,000. I can't really remember. Yeah. It was a lot, though. Mm-hmm. And But you can just, like, you can tell it wasn't just, like, a wrestling show. It's just like, hey, we're going to the show. We're just going to appreciate it for being entertainment. No, there was, like, pure, genuine, like, emotions and feelings that these people are feeling, you know? Yeah. And uh, I felt it. You know, for the first time ever, like, I felt it. It was like wrestling for the first time all over again, you know, where, like, you're about to hit the curtain, you're, like, nervous as all could be, and you have that shiver in your spine. Like, I had that shiver in my spine. Yeah. I'll never forget Same. it. Same. It was it was a strange feeling before we went out to that ring, and I, I've mentioned it before on the show, but I don't know if I mentioned this to you. I don't, I don't know if you remember, but Ricky, when we were in the back, he looks at us, and he goes, right before we hit through the curtain, he goes, remember, guys, don't take any shit out there. And when he said that, Something in me changed because I heard the roar of the crowd and I was like, oh. and it was it was like a feeling like I've never felt before in wrestling. Yeah, I got a bug up my ass when he said it. Yeah, like there was that, and then I remember when I actually debuted with uh, you guys in four four zero when Jordan or Atticus was wrestling uh, Nick Gage, and uh, it's kind of like back when I debuted. Uh, what was I talking about? Um. Oh, yeah, I got, like, that bug up my ass. Sorry, sometimes I blank a little bit. It's okay. <laughs> um, you know, I remember I was in the back, and at that time, you know, I wasn't really doing a whole lot. You know, like, I mean, I was wrestling a lot, but it was for, like, a bunch of, like, whatever places. And uh, it's not like it was unappreciated or anything like that, but I never had, like, a situation like that. Right. And you got to remember, before that happened, I've been going to GCW for a year and a half. Like, I was traveling out to every single show. You yeah. Because I was just, like searching for that opportunity right and when it finally came you know it was like a, i had a i had a very big moment i'm like okay you can't just like nonchalantly do nothing like you have to like make a presence and i remember like actually seeing schlack and uh oh, what's his name um i can't remember the other guy's name but i remember they're just like oh make a presence of yourself they're like go out there and just like how I, like nick goes out there and like pushes everybody's like actually push him on the ground <laughs> good advice i took that to heart yeah the second i hit the thing and the second i hit the curtain i literally pushed somebody out of their ass <laughs> which i don't know if you've ever done that as an adult I, not that i can think it's of. a pretty empowering feeling pushing would, somebody on the ground i would imagine and uh <laughs> <laughs> i had that but i had that same feeling for at the run rookie run thing i was like this is the first time i might actually legitimately have to like lay my hands on a fan or something like that because i feel like they're gonna go too far well, Which honestly, I I'm not the kind of person that's like it's unprofessional. You're ruining the blah blah blah. No, do it. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, don't think I'm not going to hit you back. But that's awesome. I think I love that you got that emotionally involved. That means we did our jobs right. For sure. Like, listen, and I just talked about this on Xbox podcast, which was weird that I had this light moment where I got to do Xbox podcast last week. But he was talking about you know some of the near riot situations with the NWO, and we were talking about the Cardona situation this last weekend, and. Just, I, I love the visual of people throwing stuff in the ring, but it is sort of scary. But also, oh, hurts, uh, yeah. I, I think you summed it up perfectly. If you're going to do that, uh, just be prepared that, like, you know, wrestling may be predetermined or wherever the fuck you think, but, like, yeah. some shit's going to go down. I'm not going to come out there if you fuck me up and, like, uh, pull a punch. Nope. I'm going to fucking annihilate you. And I oh, say no, this as I'm someone who's not it. a tough guy. 
Yeah. I'm not a tough guy at all. That's just defending yourself. At for sure. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. It's like, it's, like uh, it's, a, it's a crazy situation to be a part of, but I think it's something that in that moment, I don't know, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I think it was a great visual, and I'm, I'm happy to have shared that moment with you guys. But, you know, shit really went down after that incident in the ring because I believe the situation was, <laughs> as we're getting shit chucked at us, you picked up something and threw it back and hit a guy's girlfriend. Is that how that went down? Uh, no, uh, that wasn't actually it. No, um, I threw something. Yes, and one of the cameramen on the outside, Drew Casp. Sorry, <laughs> I cut his face with a little bit of glass. Oh, I felt real bad about it because I wasn't aiming for anybody. But that shit's unpredictable, and it popped, and it so happily hit him. Sure, <laughs> I felt. Awful, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I felt like a real, real bad guy. Well, I, I do remember that, but like I, I, I brought up the girl thing because uh, as we were leaving, from what I remember, and maybe uh, I don't know, you black out a lot when we were leaving. A guy hit Ricky, I and remember. and Ricky ended up having to like forearm him, and yeah. then we all swarmed this guy, and he claimed that Ricky had hit his girlfriend but then after the fact i thought that you walked up to ricky and said like oh i think i accidentally hit this chick is that oh, the case no i bumped into a girl no no i mean like like with something like you threw something you might have hit her with it if i did <laughs> um it was eric okay yeah we can put, we can put the blame on <laughs> so eric if he, anybody wants to call the cops it's uh eric hit a girl with something but also it's not like you threw the shit with intention no to hit no a girl no, no. it was probably an accident I, I just probably don't remember it because like honestly my mind was so focused on cutting drew's face that i felt like such a prick about well it. yeah i mean that's and awful. when i saw him in the back it was okay it was a prick All right, yeah. it wasn't a cut it was a very small <laughs> prick but in the time being i got a little nervous that i heard somebody i've i've legit never hurt anybody in wrestling yeah so i was like fuck it's my first time i heard somebody and it's something stupid you know right and, well well, it's it's uh, unfortunate that you can't say the same thing about other people hurting you. I mean, I know before, geez, right before you disappeared, we ended up doing fucking No Peace Underground, and you got your face smashed, dude. I did. That was nuts. You want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll talk about yeah. it. I don't care. Um, so it was like right opening spot of the match. We were just, just not actually even doing death anything. Uh, we were just wrestling, you know, and uh, Alex Ocean went for this little sidekick thing that he always does and booted me right in the face. I mean, thank God I put my hand up because I felt like it would have been way worse if I didn't. Mm. But he ended up breaking my nose and he broke my left orbital, which still to this day, I stalk a little nasally still. And I feel cold air going through my face every day. <laughs> That's not normal at all. It's not. <laughs> God, man. That's and I remember I felt bad. Obviously, I'm worried about you, but in in the moment, sometimes, you know, I'm pretty good about remembering stuff and placement and everything. And I'm like directing traffic, and there were certain points where I was talking to you, and you weren't really saying anything back, trying to just get everybody on the same page, and. Uh, I remember thinking like, fuck man, like there was like little things that were like a little off here and there. And so then when I find out that like your face was crushed, I, I was like really pissed at, and like angry because like, listen, obviously we want stuff to look good and everything, but just the fact that there are some people that go out there and, and I want to point out that, uh, you know, Alex Ocean is, uh, he since apologized. Am I right when I say yeah, that? Yeah, no, he's apologized. That's the reason I'm not like saying yeah. anything wild or nothing like that. It's just unfortunate that there's some guys out there that, uh, you know, some unintentional, some unfortunately intentional go out there with this reckless abandonment and forget that the idea of behind pro wrestling is to, at the end of the day, make sure that you guys come out unscathed. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think that's like the one thing I take a lot of pride in. I'm not the best wrestler on any show I'm on. Um, I can say that I've never hurt anybody. I've never broken any, I've never broken anything on anybody. I've never like wrestled anybody and then be like, man, wow, you're like really stiff with me. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. If you watch the way I wrestle, I don't really do a lot. Anyways, for the fact that like I'm I'm an entertainment wrestler. I'm not a I'm not like a peer wrestler or anything like that. Sure. You know. First off, I'm not that athletic. And two, I don't know. I have more fun like getting reactions out of people than trying to like portray something that's not real. You know, one hundred percent. So, 
That's but that's that's me personally, you know. Yeah. And plus, I know there's people that do that shit better. I'm not gonna do that good. No, I get it. You understand your strengths and weaknesses, and you accentuate those strengths. But one thing that I feel like you got a big strength for during the pandemic again, because we were fortunate enough to stay busy, and we had a nice source of income coming in from bookings and four four zero stuff. You really dove into the death matches a lot harder, especially working for ICW. So is yeah. there any moments during the pandemic wrestling wise that stand out for you? Um, I would definitely say like most of the stuff that we all did with each other, uh, mainly cause I just enjoyed it. You know, like I, I think just like being with everybody was always fun to me. Yeah. And there was never like any moments of just like, man, this is a bummer. Uh, which I think sometimes that stands out to me more than things I actually do in the ring is like things that happen outside of the ring. Like, I always tell people, like, the car ride home is usually my favorite thing. Oh, yeah. You know, especially when it's a full car and you got, like, a big van and everybody's comfy and we can just, like, joke around and laugh. Uh, When it came to the matches, I mean, like, my match with Tremont was a super memorable one for me. Uh, That's when I've wanted to wrestle since I got into wrestling. And the first time I ever watched him wrestle, I didn't even know he was a deathmatch wrestler because I just watched him wrestle a normal match. (laughs) Oh, wow. I was like, wow, this guy's awesome. Yeah. You know, he's a big guy that can move really well. He kind of reminded me of Dusty Rhodes. Super solid wrestler, which was, like, that's that's my jam. That's, like, my favorite of everything. He wrestled this big cowboy guy in, like, Chicago at Freelance or whatever. Do you remember uh, who the cowboy guy was? I don't remember. Saved my life. Okay. But he had a great match. I remember he did a back body drop, and I, like, jumped up and screamed. I thought it was awesome because it just looked so good. Yeah. You know? Like, people are doing wild dives and just, like, these crazy, like, lucha moves because we're in Chicago. So that's kind of like the, you know, jam out there. But he does one back body drop, and I'm... Crying like a little kid. Well, you know, listen, we we have our animosity with Tremont right now, but you know we would be lying if we didn't admit that there is an aura and a charisma about him that, despite him not looking like the prototypical professional wrestler, much like Dusty, yeah. there's something about him that compels you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't like him. No, I mean, fuck him. Yeah, but, whatever. Yeah, you know, loser. Yeah. But he's a good loser. You know, he's good at what he does. Sure. Like, there's, like, it's and it's not even, like, he's, like, the best wrestler in the ring. He's not, like, the best-looking guy ever. Like, ever, you know, where he goes, it's not like he's, like, you know, this big bodybuilder or whatever. He just, like, I don't know. Like, you watch it, just, like, he just, like, there's a, there's a form of emotion that comes with it, you know? And uh, it's kind of like watching, like, like older, like, FMW or, you know, whatever, something like that, where it's just, like, they would have cut these, like, certain promos. Or, like, there's, like, be the expression on the face or, like, you can, like, almost, like, sometimes hear, like, the choked upness, like, in the voice. Oh, yeah. Of just, like, very much being into what you're saying. Because everything you're saying isn't something that, like, you want in the back, like, all right, man, well, September, like, 31st, I'm going to see you and I'm going to kick your ass. Like, it's not, like, some stereotypical promo, you know? Right. It was always, like, something, you know, he didn't think of it and just came out, which that's the best. What about during the pandemic working for No Holds Barred and, you know, there's a different atmosphere they are doing different things in professional wrestling. Obviously, one of those things being the ring being surrounded by chains instead of ropes. How do you feel about the No Holds Barred presentation and performing as part of it? I think it's cool. Um, I like Danny. I feel like Danny was kind of a, one of the first guys to ever really kind of give me opportunities and stuff like that, which I'll always like, you know, hold close. Uh, I think the presentation of No Holds Bar is cool. Um, like, even, like, thinking back to the first time they did it, I remember, like, we all got together and watched even. And I was like, what an interesting concept. Um, I mean, my personal opinion, I wish it wasn't every show because it would make it more special. Same. Um, plus, like, you know, including myself, not every wrestler is that good of a wrestler to be able to think of something different on every show not having ropes which I feel like might be able to get a little boring at times. Yeah. Uh, besides that, though, I think the idea is great. What about the pit fighter concept? I think the pit fighter concept is cool, too. Um, yet again, this is like a personal opinion of mine. It's not – I mean, it's obviously working, so whatever. I wish there was no weapons at all in the pit fighter thing. You know, like it's like the whole like slogans like, in the pit we just fight. I wish it would just be that. Sure. I think sometimes death matches involve a little too much, which it's just another match without ropes, just like with the chains. Yeah. So it's just like, I feel like maybe a little bit of repetitiveness, but hey, I think it's cool. Yeah. It's different, you know? And like, you can't shame different. Different's awesome. It's definitely drawing people in and, uh, you know, provided a lot of entertainment during the pandemic. But, you know, you mentioned how the road trips are some of your favorite parts of the wrestling experience. And so I, I did want to mention one of the <laughs> one of the stories you brought up on a 
uh, road trip before you went missing, the fact that you just nonchalantly brought up on the way home one day that you would show up to wrestling training far too often. <laughs> high. I know where this is going. High, not on uh, the marijuana, but crack cocaine. Crack daddy. And you, you, you would say like, yeah, half the time I was, I was real out of it and blown up because I was high on crack. And I was like, what the fuck? You were on crack <laughs> when you were coming to trade? Because there were times when I would see you doing stuff and I'd be like, I don't know if this guy is going to last, but it's because you were on crack. Yeah. It all I mean, makes sense now. Listen, man, I'm an adult. I like to party sometimes. Not like that anymore, but like there was times where you wouldn't understand. I, yeah, apparently not. And you said it. Smoke a little crack. I don't know. <laughs> what? What is the so? Smoke again, and crack never kill nobody. Uh, that's not true. My mom is way dead, and it's, it's because not of crack. crack. What's it from? Maybe something else. I don't know. I'm not the crack. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was crack. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it was all of her teeth that ended up missing. Her organs were falling apart, and then she died. So it's just unfortunate she abused the crack the crack didn't abuse her right, okay yeah. i'm just kidding i'm sorry Jesus. no it's fine i don't you know i don't care but uh, so talk to me about no, why um, you thought I guess crack, see- why was crack a good decision before training i mean it wasn't a good decision it was a terrible decision yeah uh couldn't be- wait till after so all right you gotta think <laughs> what was i ever doing before i was ever like trying to be a professional wrestler you, you were in I bands right was in a bunch of bands yeah and the travel for music is way worse than pro wrestling. How so? Uh, so you got to think. Usually when you're traveling for wrestling, sometimes you travel by yourself. Somebody will get you a flight. If you are in a car, it's like just five guys and everybody's bags are in the back or something like that. When you're traveling in a band, it's one really bad van. Uh, <laughs> I was in a band just full of fat guys. And also you got to think there's a drum set. There's two giant guitar amps, a bass amp, everybody's equipment. And then everybody would have a bag as well. Oh, boy. Yeah. And we're degenerates. So... We're drinking beers the entire time. I mean, I guess not every band, but we were smoking crack a lot. <laughs> so it just was not that comfortable. And let me tell you what, rock and roll don't pay. <laughs> no, it does not, from what I understand. So you would be really broke a lot of times, like hoping to Christ that your van didn't break down or you would just run out of gas before you can make it home. Do, do you remember the first time you smoked crack? Yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, so when I was 16... Uh, me and my friends just had a couple like buddies that were like older than us and like uh, you know because we were going to shows like really young you know like uh, I can specifically remember just like going to like you know like local like rock and roll shows hardcore shows punk rock shows as a kid and I mean it's just kind of like a bar time special where people are doing cocaine you know it sobers you up enough to get you home Yeah. well I don't know if anybody that's listening to this podcast has ever hung out in Cleveland it's not the safest place on the planet. No. And usually if homeless people are coming up to you and asking you for money, it's not for a sandwich. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, we were at Peabody's and there was this notorious guy, old veteran, that would always ask for money. And one time, I remember I was like, tell me the truth. What do you need this money for? And he's like, brother, I'm trying to smoke some crack. And I was like, well, I want to try smoking crack. And I smoked crack for the first time with the homeless guy that hung outside of Peabody's. Why Why wouldn't it be with someone that you knew a little bit more personally? I mean, I knew him pretty personally. I saw him a lot. <laughs> okay, I guess that's fair. <laughs> what was his name? I mean, I don't remember. So you so didn't know him enough to know his name. Nah. He was just the guy that smoked crack outside of Peabody. Yeah, he always he was the old black guy. He'd always wear like the, <laughs> like the army jacket. He only had like a leg. He was awesome. <laughs> oh, he had a leg. Oh, no. Uh, so obviously the feeling of crack brought you back for more. Yeah. I mean, it was fun. I always had a good time. Uh, sometimes a little too much fun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of people know this cause it's <laughs> the character sometimes is a little bit of a representation of the person themselves. Sure. I had a little bit of fun, you know, uh, you know, I've been playing in bands since my early twenties. Uh, before that I was just a degenerate teenager and you know, like the only thing in the planet that like I thought was cool ever was like leather jackets and doing drugs. So like that was been my entire life motto. I mean, shit, I'm 30 and it kind of still is. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. Like it's not too far gone, you know. Sure. I mean, I'm older. I just like I feel like I can still hang though. What is the hardest drug and or craziest drug related experience that you can tell me? Um. And did it happen while you were missing? No. 
Okay. Uh, decent amount of drinking, but uh, <laughs> nah, no real hard drugs. I'm a little too old for that stuff now. Um, gotcha. 29, I've, catching up to you. It's a rough 29, all right? Yeah. It's a very different 29 than most people's 29, <laughs> can, all right? Yeah, no shit. I'm already Jake the Snake. But, uh, <laughs> oh, no. Uh, shamefully, worst drugs, uh, probably from like 19 to like 23. Uh, I dabbled with a bit of heroin for a long while oh jeez um is when i like kind of started getting like serious into tattooing is when i like stopped doing that uh and that was not as hard to stop as everybody portrayed it to be i just felt like shit for a few weeks and just like didn't think about it anymore maybe because i'm not that emotional of a person so like i didn't like have the head game yeah like that i feel like that most people deal with okay maybe i'm just not a pussy i don't know maybe don't got that puss blood inside me okay Grown ass man. Puss blood. Kick that stuff to the side. Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. But um, I did that for a while. Crazy drug experiences. Um, I've crapped my pants a couple times. Have you? Yeah. Tell me about it. Um, this may or may have not happened in the hiatus. Uh, I was on my way to court. <laughs> for what? Don't worry about it. Um, okay. I was on my All way right. to court. And I was riding my bike to court because that's why I was going to court. <laughs> so you pick have... up girls who ride bikes and you ride your bike. Listen, I illegally couldn't ride my car, drive my car, right? <laughs> okay. Um, All right. So I got to court and I probably already pooped six or seven times <laughs> on the way to court. And I got to court pretty early, which I thought <laughs> wasn't going to happen. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Are you pooping your pants because of drugs? Just listen, I'm telling a story, all right? All right. Stop asking questions. Okay. Um, so I get to court kind of early. Uh, I thought I was actually going to uh, make it probably on time, but I ended up being like 30 minutes early, and I run to the door. <laughs> and I'm like, sir, you have to let me in. <laughs> and he tells me we don't open until 8 o'clock. And I'm like, well, <laughs> if you don't let me in, I'm going to poop my pants. Okay. <laughs> And all he does is point behind me, and I look behind me, and there's a patch of woods. I look at him. I look at the woods. I look at him. He gives me a head nod. I start running. <laughs> Have you ever seen the stand-up uh, Delirious by uh, with Eddie Murphy? Yes, of course. Remember when he like makes the impression of like what white people's asses look like? Uh, that's how I was running because <laughs> oh, no. I was squeezing with all my might, but I guess I am not strong enough, and I started to then gently – shit my pants <laughs> gently. and then it was not gently afterwards and i aggressively started crap my pants <laughs> oh. and i ran into the woods pull my pants down let the rest of this demon that was inside of me come out and i then <laughs> did a wall squat for a solid 30 <laughs> minutes which i can't do that so i don't know where that strength came from beyond me and because i was afraid that i was gonna fill my shoes completely up with poo <laughs> oh my god no uh my buddy that i had to call to help me out because I can't go into court with poop pants. Sure, no. Um, is a three hundred and eighty five pound juggalo, <laughs> and I call him like, "Can you bring me a pair of pants?" And was he's this, like, no, "Wait, wait, was this the first guy you called?" Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the three hundred eighty pound juggalo was the first guy you call for a pair of pants. Yeah, he's a good guy. I know okay. that he'd help me out. You know. Well, <laughs> yeah. I figured that I meant like my pair of pants, and he's like, "Yeah, man, I'll bring you a pair of my pants right now." And I had explained him why that wouldn't work, and it didn't <laughs> make sense to him. Until I like just had to blankly say it. So then he breaks into my house, brings me a pair of pants, a wet towel, a dry towel, and a pair and a can of Axe by Africa. <laughs> I then proceed to clean myself up in a puddle in the woods, go inside, <laughs> have the rest of my court date, and I uh, went home. Love it. That's not ashamed at all. Oh, man. You know, uh, I don't know if you ended up hearing the conversation we had with Bobby Beverly, but it seems to be a trend with 440 guys that uh, they either uh, poop their pants, have something to do with poop in their life uh, on a regular basis where it shouldn't be involved, and or in the case of Bobby, he really struggled until he met Eric Ryan with how to wipe his ass. Can you believe that's a, that's a real thing? It's just real man shit. It's fine. <laughs> He just didn't know how to wipe his ass. And so, you know, I bring that up because I feel like every member of 440, while we all are the same in a lot of ways, we're very different. And I think that's what's made the group so appealing to the audience is that we all bring something different to the table. While you ended up missing, Bobby Beverly came into the fold. And I felt like Bobby Beverly is very similar to you. 
How do you feel about Bobby Beverly? And do you think that you guys are going to have good chemistry going forward? I don't see why you think that. I hate his guts. I, I didn't say that. I'm I, just kidding. I, I love Bobby to death. I, I, I just, I just feel like you guys are very, very similar. Yeah, both just real dudes. You know, I don't know. Uh, no, uh, I know. I see why. I mean, like me and Bobby are a lot into the same things. You know, the only thing that makes me and Bobby any different is that I just have a bunch of animals, and he's got like actual real kids. You know, <laughs> he, he does have real you know? kids. Yeah. So like, uh, but I think that me and him, the reason that we're a lot alike, is mainly for the fact that. For as white trash as we both are, we're like trying to pull it together. I feel like we're like the Dan Connor of Roseanne. <laughs> where it's okay. just like you're just like some shit degenerate your whole life, but like you're trying your hardest to be like, all right, listen, I can be a normal adult. Sure. But like everybody sees through it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, know? I get that. So, Bobby's trying. Bobby's trying. He really is. I, I worry about him though. And I worry about you. And obviously, as I mentioned, I worried about where you were. Now You've given me a little bit of information. Uh, I've just told a few stories. I haven't told you nothing. <sighs> Listen, I- I'm just wondering, did you at least, I don't know, did you attend any events, shows as things were opening up? Like any, did you see any family members? Did you do anything that you can mention during this hiatus from existence? I went to a wedding. Did you? I did. Okay, tell me about that. Um, so I went to a wedding. I thought I met who I thought was the love of my life. And then I woke up to realize that she was ugly as she was fat. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. Okay, no. How does that... What, do you, what does that even mean? All right, I'll explain the entire story right now. Okay. This one's kind of a doozy. It's a long one, so sit down. Um, so I went to my good friend David's wedding. Um... <laughs> This is a rough one. I feel like a lot of fans aren't going to be able to really understand this one. It's fine. It's kind of like I slept with the fam because they were not that good looking and very heavy. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. So I had a few drinks, you know. It's a party. It's a celebration. I was having a good time. Uh-huh. And my friend David then got a hotel for everybody, but only one of the rooms you could smoke cigarettes in. So obviously everybody went to that room. I see my buddy Will laying on the bed. So as a good friend... I use them as a pill. I'm laying on top of them. We're having a good time floating away, you know? And uh, this girl then jumps up on the bed and immediately puts her hand down my pants and just starts jerking me off in front of a room full of people. Under the pants, though. Okay. All right. Everybody starts to laugh. I look at my friend Will. My friend Will is a very bad friend, well, good friend, and says, you should do it. So then I portrayed to bring her downstairs, and I thought I was going to bring her in the pool. was not strong enough to get her over the wall. So then... <laughs> she was that big... She was that big. Listen, man. All right, like I've already said it a couple times. You don't got to keep bringing it up, right? All right, all right. So then I brought her underneath the stairwell, <laughs> and I banged her on top of a weed whacker. Probably where she belongs underneath the stairwell I mean, from the from the sound of it. Yeah. So then I proceeded to bang her on of a weed whacker because that was the first thing that was there. I put, what? <laughs> what? Why? Because listen. There was the only thing there. I had to prop her back up a little bit. That was the only thing besides the flat floor. And you got to work with what you got to work with sometimes, all right? Why couldn't you just move the weed whacker out of the way? Because it was already there. And I'm like, listen, it was in the moment, all right? Okay, all right, fair. I was drunk to try and get it on. Gotcha. So we were doing our thing. And there's a door that leads to the outside. And I see red and blue lights. So I, like a gentleman, ran away and left her there. <laughs> <laughs> I ran back up to the hotel room, and I opened the door, butt-ass naked, and everybody's pointing and laughing. I figure it's because my wiener's out. Mm. was not because, well, partly because my wiener was out, also because it looked like I just committed a murder. Oh, I was covered in no. blood from belly button to kneecaps. Oh, no. And so her friend then brings me into the bathroom and starts cleaning me off because I'm a baby, and I couldn't clean myself at the time because I had one too many beers. Sure. Um, and I asked her, I was like, listen, I've gotten a little bit of blood on the wiener before. Mm-hmm. This isn't no monthly thing, is it? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> I was like, I also thought, like, there was a weed whacker. I'm like, did she maybe hit herself or something? And uh, she tells me, well, she just had a baby about a month ago. <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 no. That's that. 
It's not good. For some odd reason, I wasn't like alarmed by this, and then went into the shower and started to hook up with her friend who was cleaning me <laughs> off. <laughs> Wait, what? How does that happen? It's, I don't know, man. But uh, so I am in the bathroom, and let's just say that I'm standing up, and I'm in this girl's mouth as <laughs> the friend that I was under the stairwell with mm. then barges in, and I got scared. And when I say I got scared, you have to remember, I'm in somebody's mouth. <laughs> yeah. So I jump. We fall oh. down. We break the shower door. Oh. And then they protrude, They proceeded to have a cake fight. So now I'm covered in. Body fluids, blood, and cake. How does the cake come into the picture? Like, there's a wedding. What, yeah, but like I'm saying, like, is the friend mad or is she trying to have fun in the moment? Like, oh, here's some cake, or she's like, you bitch, fucking my man, here's some cake. You know what? I I didn't stick around long enough to figure out because then I found the first T-shirt I could, which ended up being a triple X like tuxedo T-shirt, and me and my friend Will then left. We hid behind a rock as the cops were then breaking into everybody's room. So they're just like, hey, you guys are acting like wild animals. Went back to my mom's house. I told her the entire story. She made me a salami sandwich. <laughs> how many pieces of salami do you know? Oh, listen. Mama only, she knows how to do it. Okay. Ten pieces minimum. All right. I See, I appreciate that because as a kid, my dad had a five-piece minimum, and I did not. It's not enough. I did not like that. And not so enough. as a boy, I... And this is really pathetic. And Gargano made fun of me for years. My dream was the moment that I moved out of my house, I, t- I said, I'm buying a whole pound of salami and I'm putting it all on a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely. <laughs> I, it was that and a whole bag of marshmallows was my was my dream as a kid and i did that when i became an adult and then so this day johnny says you like anytime i make fun of him, he's like shut up you're pathetic you said your dream was eat a whole salami sandwich with a pound of salami and a bag of marshmallows like shut up that's a real thing he collects toys all right so do i so i can't really say anything he collects more of them, all right? That's true. That is true. <laughs> that pathetic Screw bastard. Him, all right? You may yeah. make fun of him for that. What right. a piece of garbage. Yo, okay. So can you at least tell me this? You're obviously not going to tell me exactly where you were or exactly what you were doing while you are missing. Was there a reason that you ended up going missing? Is it something that we did? I think I just got lost. I don't know. Okay. Just, just... I guess the important part... I stopped part, paying my phone bill for a little bit, so I didn't get the messages, and I just... Yeah. I ended up where I ended up. Okay. Well, you're here now, and that's what's important, and... Okay, I have something to admit to. Wait, what? I have something to admit to. What? There might be more of a reason why I'm gone. I was gone. Okay. Um... I don't know if it makes me gang affiliated or not, but it might include some bars and a orange jumpsuit and about a three meals a day. Uh, that doesn't sound good. I mean, it was fine. It was cool. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. We're, we're, we're just going to stop talking about it. What was the next question you had? <sighs> All right. Well, I, I just, I'm happy you're here and you're back and you're alive going forward. Uh, what what's going to happen for Eddie only in 2021? Is there going to be more wrestling on the agenda? Uh, is tattooing back up in full force? Uh, is the food truck going to be a thing? What is on the agenda going forward? Uh, <clears throat> the agenda for 2021 is I just want to make a good amount of money. Whether that is tattooing or professional wrestling. Probably not much of the food truck. Uh, that's only because I'm not that good of a boss and I can't find employees. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people are struggling to find employees, though. No one wants to work. That's true. Yeah, nobody does want to work. I get it. I mean, if I was making unemployment, I probably wouldn't work either. But right. prison, I mean, not being uh, pro uh, wrestling, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's where I'm going to make my money from. Uh-huh. Sure. And uh, no, there's going to be a lot more of me come uh, 2021. Yeah, boys are back in town, brother. I love it. I love. I love that you're back. And uh, man, you, I mean, you're going right into the main event. I mean, we, we're we're back at H two O with all the belts. So hopefully, they'll have to create a new belt for you to win as well. But also, September, we got War Games, baby, in Chicago. We do. That's that's gonna be fucking crazy. Listen, I feel like that town has a very certain aura around it. Um, I saw 
some of my first death matches there besides down at IWA. And uh, I felt like there was always a very, uh, just a, like a wild bug in the air every time I would go there. I felt like everybody was kind of on their A game. And I felt like matches were a little bit more violent and a little bit more bloody than I've ever seen them. And uh, I, I got to, I don't know. I might not be around much after September. Just because, like, I have a feeling it's going gonna, it's gonna to get a little bonkers. Well, don't say that because we want to keep you around and we love you and we care about you. And uh, I guess. Oh, I'm not going to get hurt. Oh. What if you guys get hurt? Then I won't see you because then I'll have to, like, carry the team. All right. Calm you know, down. I'll be all by myself because we all, all got that little boy blood, you know? I guess we'll end this by asking you, while you were missing, uh, I'm sure you went through a lot of highs and lows. Uh, emphasis on highs and lows. <laughs> now that you're back, what inspires you going forward? What keeps you going, Eddie Only? Pussy, money, weed. Was that all one word? Uh, pussy, money, and weed. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. There was a couple com. There was one comma and an and in there. Gotcha. Uh, no. Um, no, I've got no inspirations at all. Uh, I just basically want to take over wrestling with my friends. I guess that's as much inspiration as all it's got to be. I love the sound of that, and you I know, think I, we're doing a good job. Yeah, because like when it comes down to it, my inspirations don't come from being like a kid. You know, I, I don't have the same, like, wrestling story as everybody else. Like, when I was, like, eight years old, I was like, Dad, I want to be Hulk Hogan. First off, I didn't have a dad, and I didn't really like Hulk Hogan that much as a kid. <laughs> didn't learn to appreciate him until I got a little bit older. Fair. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just want to do cool. I just want to do cool things with my friends. That's all it really comes down to, man. I, can, I just I want can... to see us all get around and make some money. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you, and I thank you for – shedding some light into what happened these last eight months. And more importantly, I appreciate your friendship and it's just, it's good to have you back around, man. Appreciate your friendship too. Someone wanted to find you on social media. How could they do that? Twitter or Instagram. Don't look at Facebook. (laughs) What? (laughs) Do you you have a name that they can look up? Oh yeah. Uh, Eddie, E D D Y only O N L Y with the number eight. Don't ask what they it's for. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. You're welcome. That was the interview with Eddie Only. We're happy that he's home safe and sound. And I thank him for his time. Aaron, I'm not going to ask you about three things about Eddie Only. I want you to end this podcast however you want to end it because you just seem like you're in How about with... Only one thing That's about fine. Eddie. Sure. Fantastic tattoo artist. Yeah. I entrusted him with my body. Sure did. And he took it to a different level. And now I <laughs> have a tattoo that says art. So here's what I'm really trusting him with. The cover up. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't so part of the deal. Do we uh, Do we film that too? We could. All right. What if I have it switched? As, it, it would say Barry. What if I just get all the horsemen names? Arn, Barry, Rick. You know, you probably who, could do who, that. Because that. uh, that's my guy. But that's when I grew up. I, I grew up with the four horsemen renewing, and Sid was a huge part of it. I thought Sid was, oh, an excellent addition. What did you guys think? Ryan's not on the podcast right now. He was only on What did Patreon. you think? <laughs> when I say you guys, I mean our, um, our uh, what, what do you want to call this? The uh, Iron On Wrestling Universe? <laughs> sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm a big Paul Roma guy. You going to get Roma on your arm? <laughs> I get that. I got Arn. <laughs> yeah, my well. arm. Every day I get questions from people that are like, uh, uh, what, does it say Arn? <laughs> on your arm. On your arm? Yeah. And I go, yeah, why would I get Arm on my Arn? On my arm. Jesus, come uh, on, man. Shit. Get it together. All wow. Right. So that's it. You're going to get a Four Horsemen tattoo? I guess. I don't know. What else do you think I should get? Sarah on your neck. <laughs> on my throat. Emily. Uh, maybe uh, iron on wrestling. Don't do that. Why? 
this is over? Well, no, but I mean, <laughs> inevitably, one day I'm sure the podcast will end and it'll just say iron I don't believe so. Your neck. I believe every day we're hustling. What? The band is still doing That's true, but huh? he took a break for a while. What am I hearing? Cole Cabana. It's, he, no, no, no. What am I hearing? What do you mean? I thought this guy wasn't on the podcast. He's not. He's just <laughs> talking what's, in the background. What's he had, going on? He had Ryan Egan on Patreon. Oh, good and you God threw, Almighty. You threw it to him when his mic wasn't on, yeah, and so now yeah. we're talking to him in the background. <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk. No. Well, your mic is off completely, so even if you turn it on, you won't So you're be still heard. talking? Yep, so you can't hear him. So oh anyways, boy. if you All want right. to hear That's from Ryan Egan. That's the worst Egan episode his, we've ever done. If you good, want to hear good night, Ryan, everybody. You keep interrupting me as I talk. It's almost like that's your gimmick or something. Ryan will have some bonus topics over on Patreon. He's also on the Patreon bonus of this podcast, which you can hear for three bucks. We also get a follow back on social media from Aaron and I. Hope you enjoyed this episode. It's this trip down memory lane with Eddie only in an effort to figure out where the hell this guy was for eight months. I think we sort of succeeded, but not really. So maybe we'll find out some more stuff about him down the line. But until then, thanks for tuning in this week. Come back next week for episode 115. Who's going to be on? I don't know. You'll find out when I do. That's for sure. But until then, subscribe to the podcast. Do it on YouTube as well. Make it five stars on iTunes. It creates visibility for the podcast. Leave a comment on iTunes about the podcast, preferably a good one. We would appreciate that. Of course, follow me on social media. You can do that at Gregory Iron on Twitter, at Gregory underscore Iron on Instagram. Find me on Facebook as well. Go to my Pro Wrestling Tees, prowrestlingtees.com slash Gregory Iron. If you want to book me for pro wrestling, motivational speaking, pro wrestling seminars, contact me, either DM via social media, or of course, my email, Gregory underscore iron at yahoo.com. I also have a website, Gregory-iron.com. And of course, find me on Cameo. Just did a nice little birthday Cameo shout out for someone that coincidentally turned 69 this past week. I, I got to assume that was a real birthday. And that's it. Aaron, what would you like to plug? Uh, you know what? I think people should book us for live shows. That could be a thing that happens. Okay. Who knows? Well, I'm um, at Fair to Air on Twitter and at Fair to Aaron on Instagram. I ain't got nothing else. I don't okay. got shit going on. Sounds depressing. <laughs> 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 With that being said, you know, I love Eddie only, but I, I love another Eddie. His name is Eddie Money. I oh. feel like we should just play him out to end the show. Sounds good to me. Yeah, do you hear him in the background right now? I got... Two tickets to pair. Nope, that's not the song I'm playing. It's almost like I'm going to put it over in post. Okay. You can't actually hear it right now. But okay. you can imagine what it'd be like if he was playing right now, right here. I feel a hunger. It's a hunger. Hear that? Oh, there it is. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you could always tell with that guitar riff. Uh huh. Okay. Well, kiss goodbye. <laughs>